Good afternoon or evening, students. This is Mr. Tremblay, and I'm going to give you the beginning of a discussion of To His Coy Mistress, a famous poem from the 17th century by Andrew Marvell. So let's begin. Who is the speaker in this poem? And I assume you're going to be reading along with us, or you've read the poem already. That should be a prerequisite for starting this. So if you have not read the poem, please go back and do so. And start again. Well, the speaker is a man faced with a reluctant or coy. Coy is a good vocabulary word, meaning she is just not maybe ready to commit to him. Um, of his coy mistress. He's trying to persuade her to love him. What can we infer about this man from the way he talks? Considering his diction, his manner, the attitude he has, his education, or anything else. Let's make some logical assumptions. He's urbane, meaning he's sophisticated, and that kind of sophistication probably comes from his experience. He's no new newcomer to love, or you could say that he's not an apprentice to the craft of wooing. Think about, after reading this poem, what his attitude is toward love. Well, we could say that he's not self-indulgent, he's not youthfully sentimental about love, and we could probably make the assumption that he's older. And by that, I would say he's probably in his mid-twenties, maybe 30 back in those days. 30 would be a pretty good guess, pretty good ballpark estimate. What can we infer about his education? Let's think about it. Well, if you read the poem carefully, you will see logic in his argument. You will see that he's witty. He's very smart. You will see that he's eloquent. Let's look at a sample of some of his diction here. Now, therefore, while the youthful hue sits on my skin like morning dew, now let us sport, while we, sport us while we may. And now, like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour. So what kind of diction is that? Well, it's very clever. Um, it's very carefully contrived and worked out. Notice he uses words like therefore. Uh, notice the transitions he uses. So it's a very carefully constructed argument. Let's look at the second sample. The graves are fine in private place, but none, I think, do their embrace. So notice the rhyme, but combined with wit. He seems self-assured and poised. He's probably a courtier, as we talked about in Chaucer, or even in Shakespeare, someone who attends or is part of the royal court, or at least dresses like that, or at least appears like that. Secondarily, who's the mistress in this poem? How do you picture her appearance? Could it look like so something like the picture on the left or on the right? Which one would you choose? Think about it for a second. Even though she doesn't say very much, she has no active verbal role, she actually doesn't say anything, we can draw a picture of her, an image of her, through what the suitor, the, the man, is saying and what he's implying. So what does the speaker imply? Let's think about it. Well, we should not think of her as a concubine or a prostitute, uh, as some students may by reading this poem. She do, uh, the, the poem doesn't really portray her in this modern sense of the word. Otherwise, the whole thing would be nonsense. It wouldn't make any sense. Mistress really is referring here to the older meaning of sweetheart or beloved. In other words, a woman who would command... Uh, a man's affections. Today we would call her something like a serious girlfriend. But she wouldn't look like this. You would definitely think of her in terms of class and in terms of grace and in terms of manners 
is something much more like this. She would have class, she would have intelligence. And we talked earlier about the courtly love tradition that began with the famous poet Petrarch and that continues on here. Uh, you know, given that tradition, this, this mistress is probably very proud of her beauty. And she probably relishes the idea of her lover praising her. Her coyness, her reluctance to yield to this man's advances might suggest that she actually looks down or condescends or disdains her lover, as she would all lovers. She's the type of woman who demands that their suitors prove their worthiness. How do they do that? And this is a big part of the poem in the, in the first stanza, by endless gestures of adoring her and being faithful to her. We would call it today maybe playing hard to get. Her social position would be no lower than the speaker's. It has to be higher or upper class. And if you think of those slides below, that would be upper class in the olden days. And today, an upper class woman would look something like this. So if, if, if this poem were written today, you could picture a woman looking a lot like this. Pretty expensive dress she's wearing here, too. If she were, for example, the innkeeper's daughter, this kind of speech that he uses wouldn't make any sense. It would just be wasted. All right, we're going to think about the structure of the poem as having three main sections. From The first part would be from had we but world enough to love at a lower rate, lines 1 to 20. Then lines 21 to 33, from but at my back, all, all the way to do their embrace. And the third section which I read a little bit of earlier, now therefore to its conclusion. So it's a 46-line poem. So what is the first section doing? It's giving the reader this vision of a courtship that is totally free from the restraints of space and time. It's like their love is very idealized and perfect. What would a perfect love be like? In this case... This lady's coyness or her reluctance becomes kind of positive, strangely enough. How is that? Think about it for a second. Well, by her being coy, the speaker can continue to praise her. He can worship her at this very slow, and when you read the poem carefully, leisurely pace, since they would have forever to fall in love. It seems like the lovers have taken control of history. Time is when they're within their grasp or their power because they go backwards into the remote past, all the way back to the Great Flood. It's as if they control history, time, and space. But they may also love forward in time, all the way in this poem to the conversion of the Jews. And we'll talk about what that means as we go through this in class. So we have this idyllic vision, this perfect vision of paradise, where the world has become their garden, much like the world of Adam and Eve. So what about the imagery? We're going to talk about the imagery of this first section. Mainly, we have imagery of water. Look at the poem and see if you can find anything else. What are the key images? Look in that first stanza, that first section that I mentioned earlier. The imagery of leisurely growth is what's dominant. The lady herself is, in, is imagined in the setting appropriate to her beauty and her social rank. We're on the exotic banks of the Ganges River in India. And there's a picture of the Ganges. 
the speaker, interesting love, and interesting enough, is lamenting. He's sorrowful about her coyness as he waits by the shores of the very chilly river in England, which shows very strong contrast here to the Ganges. Note that she gathers or receives two gifts in this first section. What are the gifts? Can you find them? She collects rubies at the side of the Ganges. Which may give you an idea of her worth. She receives from him the richer gift. What's the gift she gets from him in this first section? His flattery. And that flattery is carried on down through a huge span of time, through the centuries even. If this flattery were to go on for centuries, would he still be flattering her today, if the two were still alive? What would you say? I would say doubtful. And you want to think about that. But at any rate, what impact does this first section of the poem have? Well, within the terms of his vision, this opening section is praising tremendously her charms or her value in his eyes. And don't forget, this is only the first part or like act one in a play. Which leads us to section two. And in section two, we have several major shifts occurring. Now, what I'd like you to do is think about what they are, and we will start to discuss those in class.